Welcome to Future Histories. My name is Jan Groß and it is my great pleasure to welcome Nick Dyer Witherford in today's episode. Nick is professor at the Faculty of Information and Media Studies at the University of Western Ontario, Canada. His work as an author include Cybermarks, Cycles and Circuits of Struggle in High Technology Capitalism from 1999 or Cyberproletariat, Global Labor in the Digital Vortex from 2015 and together with Alte Mikola Kiosen and James Steinhoff, Inhuman Power, Artificial Intelligence and the Future of Capitalism from 2019. He was also an early and very important contributor to the revived debate around democratic economic planning, which features quite prominently in future histories as well, with his 2013 paper Red Planty Platforms. And I'm absolutely thrilled and honored to welcome Nick in today's episode, in which we will talk about his most recent work, a paper on biocommunism titled Biocommy power and catastrophe. When recording the interview, I was a bit sick and you might hear it from time to time in my voice. I hope it didn't interfere too much with the coherence of my questions, though. I pre-produced this episode for the summer, which means I'm not able to thank the most recent Patreon supporters and or donors by name. And so I will take this as a chance to thank you all. Thank you for your interest in Future Histories. Doing this is such a joy for me and being able to talk to wonderful people and thinkers like Nick every two weeks is simply such a pleasure and uh, important part of my life that I wanted to take the chance to thank you all and of course thank all of my guests. So now please enjoy today's episode with Nick Dyer Witherford on biocommunism. <music> Welcome, Nick. Thanks for inviting me to the show, Jen. Uh, Future Histories has been a, a great source of inspiration uh, for me, sometimes in quite bleak times. So it's a real pleasure to be on the show today. Well, it's an absolute pleasure to have you, Nick. Thank you very much. In your most recent work, you developed the concept of biocommunism, building on a term you introduced around a decade ago. However, the way you use the term now is different from the way you used it back then. Before we dive deeper into the different elements of what you propose as biocommunism today, how did you define biocommunism back then? How do you define it now? And what made you rethink the way in which you define the concept? Biocommunism is a term that, as far as I know, Uh, I was the first to use uh, in a series of uh, essays written in about the mid-2000s on Marx's concept of species being, Gutungswesen, and uh, about how it might be uh, renovated and applied for the 21st uh, century uh, in the midst of uh, capitalism's deployment of, tech of digital technologies, genetic transformations, and, and the like. Now, those early papers on this topic, uh, I think, well, can be characterized as optimistic. They were informed by a sort of lingering, ultra-globalist sense that another world uh, is, is possible, by Hart and Negri's uh, use of, uh, of the term biopolitics in empire. And they're suffused uh, with an ethos of what would later uh, be called accelerationism. Um, the same sort of concepts and attitudes that generated works like Cernicek and Williams' Inventing the Future and Helen Hester's Xenofeminism and Aaron Bastani's Fully Automated Luxury Communism. So the thought ambience was that there was a sort of technological momentum to capitalism in these digital and genetic uh, uh, technologies and, and, and uh, new forms of energy production that would favor the creation of a post-capitalist communal society. So then a few things happened, uh, such as the 2008 financial crash, the rise and fall of Occupy, the ascent of the far right. And amidst all this, I forgot about biocommunism until a couple of years ago, I was contacted out of the blue by a young uh, scholar, a graduate student in Denmark, who encountered another version of biocommunism independently developed in the work of the Polish philosopher Simon Rogo. 
And uh, Philip asked me what, if anything, I was doing <laughs> with the idea. Uh, and my answer was uh, not much right now. But his question remained with me so, uh, like an earworm of what could biocommunism mean now in the 2020s? Um, so, of course, if one looks around um, in this uh, context, some pretty disturbing things have been happening in, rega in regard to human species being a worldwide pandemic in full swing. A, a huge economic slump with globally immiserating consequences, a European war between opposing nuclear armed blocs, and then the increasingly desperate reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, whose warnings about the uh, planetary biosphere are uh, being given concrete illustration every uh, by daily disaster reports of fire, floods, heat waves, etc., across. Uh, across uh, uh, the, uh, the entire planet. It's, it's a dire and calamitous scene. And uh, so I, uh, my return to uh, uh, biocommunism uh, really att uh, att is an attempt to find a politics adequate to contemporary uh, species being, but set against this far more somber horizon. Now, I know um, we're going to go into some detail into the different components of um, this iteration of, uh, uh, of biocommunism, but perhaps it might be useful just to quickly uh, give your listeners a thumbnail of, of what I'm pointing at with this term. I am uh, attempting to uh, hypothesize a a uh, new mode of uh, beyond capitalism, collective social uh, reproduction, which I term biocommunism, uh, uh, and I conceive of as a process of combined social and environmental leveling, creating a social system that steers itself between the double boundaries of ecological sustainability and equalized social development and does so through processes of collective and democratic social planning. So this is, the biocommunism is a program that uh, fuses the goals of contemporary movements fighting against ecocide and inequality. It, it is uh, what one might uh, term a project of ecological equ uh, equality, equalizing and ecological power. I attempt to propose a system in which uh, the state form persists as a major hub for marshalling and administration of vital resources and is hence crucial for the left to occupy, but in which uh, the state is also only one point amidst a wider networks of communal self-organization and mutual aid. So these two components, what we might term the state apparatus, and autonomous or communizing organizations are in dialogue, cooperation, and perhaps also creative tension. And it is this entire complex field of organizations that constitutes the governmentality of biocommunism. So uh, in this way, I want to suggest a form of governance that becomes what Marx and Engels termed a process of vast association, a phrase from the manifesto. Now, I'll acknowledge uh, right from the start that there are some serious limitations to my futuristic uh, depiction. I jump immediately to issues of governance, and I say very little, if anything, about uh, the actual process of transition and, uh, and, the, uh, and the struggles that, uh, that might lead to it. Uh, my uh, horizons are inescapably, I think, somewhat bound by my position as an inhabitant of the global Northwest. Uh, I don't, for example, deal with the issue of uh, catastrophe politics in China. And while uh, uh, my paper on this topic uh, has some uh, engagement uh, uh, with the profound predicaments of the global south. It is mainly through the lens 
of issues of migration and refuge in the context of global, global warming. So for, there are some um, acknowledged and serious insufficiencies to the picture uh, that I'm painting. And uh, it is uh, in many ways intended uh, just as yet a further um, provisional uh, sketch and contribution to the uh, work by many, many hands that is going uh, into addressing this, uh, this question of beyond uh, capitalism. But I think you, will, uh, you might gather from the thumbnail that I am uh, trying to bridge uh, some long-standing divides, not just uh, between uh, green and red, but also between centralizers and decentralizers, between state socialists and autonomists and anarchists. So, of course, everyone will be unhappy with the propositions. Uh, I accept that and, again, only emphasize that this is a thought experiment uh, intended as part of a vastly wider process. Um, you describe biocommunism as a new form of governmentality. You just... <clears throat> I'm sorry. Uh, you, you describe it as a form of governmentality that takes into account the, the current multiplicity of crisis that form the catastrophic conditions that any alternative will have to work with. And I'm very much uh, interested in the governmentality part of it. But in order to kind of set the scene for this, could you maybe give us an idea of the multidimensional crisis that we are living in? What are the elements that come together there? Uh, but by all means, now, I, I, and I should say this idea of a multidimensional uh, uh, crisis is uh, not uh, is not mine. In fact, uh, I'm drawing on several other usages. Uh, for example, the term uh, polycrisis, uh, referring to the intersection of um, economic, uh, epidemiological, and ecological crises has been uh, popularized by the historian and uh, journalist uh, Adam Tooze in his uh, recent and I think very good uh, book on the uh, COVID pandemic uh, shutdown. Uh, now, uh, Tooze and others who use the term polycrisis uh, tend to regard this sort of uh, compounding state of emergencies as uh, an aberrant departure from uh, the norms of the world market But there are um, other perspectives that can be taken on this. And uh, I recently had the pleasure of listening to uh, Alex uh, Kalinikos's retirement speech um, on the topic of a new age of catastrophe in which he argues, contra uh, to and other liberals, that uh, the present poly crisis should be seen as the culmination or logical outcome of capitalism's exploitation of the natural and human world. And I think it is, in fact, uh, Kalinikos from whom I get this phrase, a multidimensional crisis involving uh, biological elements with uh, global warming as exhibit one, but accompanied by other symptoms such as the zoonotic overspill of pandemic un uh, unleashed by deforestation and agribusiness. Economic with uh, the problems of stagnancy, uh, inequality and financial instability, uh, that manifested in the great crisis of 2008, remaining unresolved and, uh, and uh, now acquiring uh, new symptoms and new intensities. Geopolitical crisis in the struggle for global hegemony between uh, rival blocs with the US and, and the European Union on one side and China and Russia on the other with lesser powers jockeying for position in between. And then uh, political been referred to as the extreme center of uh, globalizing neoliberalism uh, is starting to cave in under pressure by what we might talk, uh, call uh, populist eruptions, primarily, but not exclusively, from the far right. So um, my recent iteration of biocommunism is uh, an attempt to conceive of the politics that are, that are demanded uh, by this uh, type of uh, uh, complex multidimensional crisis, so especially if one thinks of the poly crisis as not being a, a punctual event, but a persistent one that goes on for a while. This really raises the issue of, of what a communism might look like in that context. So what I'm trying to do really 
is uh, to map an archipelago of sites and situations and subjectivities that appear in the midst of intensifying turmoil, islands of counterpower that might be connected in some new collective system. So this is conceived within a sort of near to mid future horizon unfolding over a decade or so, during which the multidimensional crisis uh, continues, perhaps intensifies. We have to optimistically assume that abyssal depth such as full-scale nuclear war remain unplumbed because in that case, all bets are off. Uh, but we're in a situation in which successful governance is increasingly defined by the sustenance of populations under mounting ecological, economic, and geopolitical stress. That's the context for uh, my thinking about biocommunism. Okay, great. Let's get to the governmentality part because I'm really very much interested in, in, in this one. And there's a strand of uh, future history within future histories that kind of deals uh, with the question of alternative governmentalities. And um, I think it's absolutely crucial to, to address this layer. I think most of the episodes are unfortunately in German, the ones that, uh, that deal with uh, alternativen Regierungskünsten. So uh, I was in general very much excited to, to see you approach biocommunism from the angle of governmentality. And uh, there's this famous quote by Michel Foucault in which he states that there is no intrinsically socialist governmentality and that it needs to be invented. And am I right in reading your text as a kind of first uh, attempt in pointing towards such a direction? Do we need to invent new forms of governmentality and is biocommunism an attempt to do so? Absolutely. Um, your your, your um, suggestion is, is, is completely uh, spot on. The very remark of Foucault's that you cite was one of the starting points Uh, points for uh, my thinking about biocommunism. Uh, and I, I'm also uh, excited uh, to hear about this strand on future histories in regard to Foucault and governmentality. I actually became aware of this a little bit by uh, looking at the prospectus for your forthcoming book, where I, I see your, uh, uh, your pieces on this topic. So as you'll know well, there, there are many different opinions on mixing Marx, uh, Marx and Foucault. Um, some think that they don't go together at all. Uh, but I am with those who uh, consider that Foucault is much better read with Marx than against Marx. Uh, this is what is sometimes called the Italian Foucault, the Foucault of the Italian autonomous Marxists such as uh, Tony Negri and uh, Tiziana Terranova. Uh, who conceive of a biopolitics that uh, has a dimension uh, that emerges and fights from below rather than simply being imposed uh, from above. And I share their opinion that uh, a contemporary Marxism must be a, bi a, bi a biopolitics that grasps social struggles, not just uh, at the point of production, and we shorthand that as a factory, uh, but um, throughout the entire circuit of capital, where, it is, where production is threaded with circulation and social reproduction, and indeed across an entire planet factory that exists uh, today, uh, entailing issues of the reproduction of nature and the environment as it too is exploited and developed by capital. Now, where I might depart from some of my uh, autonomous friends um, is in saying that this Marxist biopolitics must indeed actually be a project of governmentality, of biopower. And here I think Foucault's concept is very rich because uh, to me it speaks of a concept where governance is not just a question of uh, state apparatus, but something much more diffuse and multi-layered Uh, if we uh, pick up on Deleuze's uh, response to Foucault, we can almost say where, is it, where um, governance becomes a question today of rhizomatic uh, structures. And I would say um, that uh, one might say that the, the task of a, a communist uh, biopolitics 
is precisely to ensure that this that such uh, diffuse and uh, rhizomatic structures uh, are, of uh, of governmentality uh, become the me uh, the mechanisms of a power that is not simply um, imposed from above, but that rises up uh, from below to forge its, uh, its own uh, communal organization of society. So uh, you describe six elements of biocommunism, and these are new disaster relief systems, open borders to migrant fleeing calamity, uh, expropriation of capital from crisis critical industries, rationing of consumption, mobilization of emergency labor and ecological and economic planning. So let's go through these elements one by one and start with the first one. Could you describe the new disaster relief system you're thinking of? Yeah, I quite intentionally uh, chose as a starting point an aspect of contemporary social existence that might seem um, Uh, somewhat peripheral or eccentric in terms of traditional uh, Marxian thinking. There'll be, of course, the you know, Marxian uh, uh, analysis is always powerfully started from the point of production. I want to suggest that we are in a context uh, today where in some ways it is necessary to start from the point of destruction point at which um, the violent and damaging effects of capitalism begin uh, to manifold, uh, begin to manifest uh, in the uh, many, many catastrophes that are uh, emerging, the floods and fires of global warming, pandemics, wars. So um, the apparatus that modern capitalist society Uh, has developed to deal with these types of uh, abrupt disruptions of the normal order are known in the uh, professional jargon as um, vital systems security. And these um, uh, measures for the security of uh, vital systems are today part of the administrative toolkit of capitalist societies, often involving Uh, very, very complex um, articulations, both centralized and decentralized um, agencies, um, all geared uh, towards uh, the management of outbreaks of, uh, of disease or um, various forms of so-called natural disaster. Now, uh, this is uh, a system that in many ways reflects the priorities Uh, of the social order that developed it. It's uh, very largely concerned with uh, protection uh, of property uh, as well, and, 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 and sometimes uh, much more so uh, than of people. It has a major concern with uh, the preservation of, uh, uh, of civil order, the prevention of outbursts of social protest and disobedience in, situ uh, in situations of calamity. Much of it is actually uh, involved also with preparations for international war. But this is uh, also paradoxically a set of uh, emergency uh, measures and institutions that has recently been significantly undermined by the very logic of capitalist uh, accumulation uh, um, through the effects of neoliberal austerity and its reliance on uh, just-in-time systems. So, uh, for example, in the uh, current uh, COVID uh, pandemic, we saw a revelation of the, a deep unpreparedness certainly in the OECD countries, for what had actually been um, a, a long predicted event, a, a, a global flu-like uh, pandemic. And as a result, a disaster uh, uh, management was often incompetent, confused and contradictory. It exposed how threadbare various uh, crucial institutions such as uh, uh, healthcare systems had become. The pandemic and other disasters, including storms and floods, 
also uh, have revealed uh, how uneven, uh, how uh, shaped by discriminations around class and race and gender uh, disaster relief is, uh, how much it suffers from also from the uh, neglect and lack of communication uh, with the very communities uh, that it is meant to be protecting. My thesis is that such disasters are going to become even more common and that indeed the test for any post-capitalist system, the sort of touchstone for their superiority, uh, will, uh, will actually uh, be their capacity to better protect their inhabitants from such catastrophes. I think that this will involve massive investments in social infrastructures, ranging from hospitals to cooling systems for, for um, uh, heat wave afflicted cities, uh, flood control, vaccine manu uh, manufacturing, uh, even the, uh, the security of, um, uh, of food supplies. And it will also uh, require not simply the construction of the technical infrastructures for this, but a much higher degree of dialogical communication with affected and endangered populations and communities to arrive at some degree of social consensus around how to handle these very difficult situations. I think this is a situation in which, in fact, much of this disaster planning will have to uh, uh, continue to draw on the apparatus of, uh, of, uh, the, of the state. We will indeed need a crisis state, but in a, uh, a better and more benign form than, uh, than that that is provided under capital in order to marshal expertise, emergency supplies, resources, and equipment. But also this official apparatus of disaster relief uh, should draw on, support, and cooperate with initiatives of mutual aid and community self-organization of the sort that has been long discussed in anarchist and autonomous thinking about, uh, to quote a phrase from the Out of the, the Woods Collective, disaster communism, the, the uh, capacities of people to self-organize uh, in, uh, in situations of severe social stress. So, you know, in some ways, I think what is needed is a, a sort of reworked revival of the traditions of popular mobilization in the face of socio-natural disasters that we saw practiced to some extent by um, uh, in socialist societies uh, such as Cuba. I did, did some reading around the quite extraordinary way in which Cubans prepare for recurrent uh, hurricane uh, disasters, with a sense that this is an occasion which actually calls for uh, communal mobilization and social uh, solidarity. And this becomes um, a part of, uh, of the entire social orientation towards this kind of danger. So um, this is the point in which uh, I, I choose to start my analysis uh, of uh, biocommunism, as I suggested heretically departing from uh, initiating it at the point of production, going to the point of destruction. But, of course, one has to remember that the point of production is also the point of destruction. One has to think, you know, about the Amazon warehouse with its roof torn off in uh, a, 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 a hurricane. Or one has to think of a meat packing plant with a raging COVID uh, outbreak on the shop floor, or social service officers being slowly inundated by uh, the uh, rising waters in coastal areas. So in fact, what we're really talking about, we could say, is the equivalent of a health and safety crisis in the planet factory, which calls for a comprehensive global health and safety response. Does that give uh, some sense of, 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 uh, of what I'm getting out with this attention to disaster relief? Yes, yes, absolutely. And uh, I, I just saw that I made a note um, uh, where, where you say in the text, as capitalism's own forces of production turn against it. And this just reminded me of the, the way you described the destruction that already went into the modes of production when talking about the Amazon uh, Amazon warehouse. But I'm still wondering whether or not 
this is actually to the benefit of capitalism or not. Because, uh, I mean, somehow you seem to think that it will turn against it. And this, of course, would be a nice thing to have. But still, uh, it kind of reminds me of, of this uh, question of multidimensional crisis and whether or not this is actually... Uh, maybe a different mode of disaster capitalism, uh, which kind of benefits of this um, this destruction, this confusion, this this mayhem, and everything uh, around it. So, uh, I, I really, really like the this idea of a bio communism that is forged around what you call with in reference to to Fraser formed around a politics of care. So, I really uh, like this idea that we have a different kind of offer in the form of biocommunism. And this offer is a, a form of politics of care. But still, I was just wondering whether or not you think that this catastrophe, this destruction, if this is really turning against capitalism or not. No, it, uh, it's, it, it's an excellent question, Jan. And uh, I do agree with you. Um, disaster capitalism, as articulated by Novi Klein, and indeed, even earlier theories of the way in which apparent catastrophe could be turned uh, to a new occasion for accumulation, such as Tony Negri's uh, theses on the crisis state, are very important uh, to this analysis and uh, very much uh, in, uh, in play. That is the logic, shall we say, on the other side of the hill, right? Um, but I also think, um, we should qualify, just as you have properly qualified, any uh, suggestion in, in my account that there is an, any uh, sort of uh, automaticity to uh, a progressive uh, outcome to, uh, to catastrophe. So I think we have to qualify any um, uh, assumption that capitalism can itself automatically handle and recuperate uh, disaster. Um, I think it's by no means clear that capital can always control disaster. Um, you can get a runaway situation, and, and indeed we may be in such a runaway situation in which you know, the uh, frantic attempts uh, at improvisation uh, to control the poly crisis that, that, that Tews and others uh, have described seems only to generate fresh problems. You know, we pass from the pandemic to uh, runaway inflation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, again, uh, there is no reason uh, per se that this runaway effect uh, will uh, will go in a positive direction. It it could be terrible. It could you know it could result in in um, in outcomes uh, worse than uh, capitalism uh, itself. Uh, you know, uh, if we appeal to socialism or barbarism, we're talking a heads or tails situation. Uh, what I am uh, suggesting with biocommunism is. Uh, what many others have suggested, the need uh, to think of how resistance and alternative also appear as possibilities, not as certainties, but as projects, even in the middle uh, of disaster. Uh, this is the logic of Out of the Woods, as I, I've already mentioned their concept of disaster communism. Uh, one could also speak of it in, uh, as an activity of what uh, Richard Seymour and his associates term um, salvage socialism, the attempt at the reconstruction of a beyond capitalism uh, in the midst of, of what I would uh, characterize as an increasingly volatile um, uh, set of intersecting crises, which may not be fully controllable by anyone at this point. Yes, absolutely. And the idea that capitalism can always be uh, in the position of controlling disasters, actually uh, already idealizing capitalism again, I would say somehow. So this is a very good point you're making. So let's uh, take a look at the next element of biocommunism, which would be um, migration and refuge. What would these elements look like? So um no, uh, we are uh, evidently in a situation uh, in which millions of displaced people today are on the move around uh, because of the combined and indeed virtually inseparable effects of poverty, ecological devastation, war, 
and oppression of uh, what um, Saskia Sassen has, has spoken of as a loss of habitat is tragically and with and grossly unfairly concentrated uh, in tropics and equatorial zones where global warming is most severe and the malign legacies of colonialism and imperialism already deeply mark uh, the uh, social order so that with a double injustice, populations least responsible for carbon emissions are most vulnerable in terms of poverty, frail infrastructures, insufficient public services. Now, you know, the emergent patterns of migration are in fact very complex. We know that in fact, most migrants move today from one country uh, to another adjacent to it. So very often you have people moving from one relatively poor or disadvantaged country to another, yet further dressing the uh, 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 social systems. But also um, these migration flows move towards the rich world across the Mediterranean or to the US-Mexico border and other fr uh, frontiers. And this is where migrants uh, face exclusion, detention, deportation, criminalization, abandonment, death. In this situation, uh, we have uh, seen the emergence of uh, self-organization by migrant communities under uh, slogans such as no one is illegal or, or the border is closed, but we will cross uh, uh, anyway. And we've also seen, I think, the emergence of uh, important um, uh, movements supporting these struggles. Now, there are complex uh, debates which in which I'm not actually going to pretend to um, uh, ex uh, expertise between advocates of open borders who uh, advocate relaxing uh, state regulations on migration and advocates of no frontiers who um, uh, favor abolishing state sovereignty to core. Um, you know, uh, this is difficult and controversial set of debates, but it does seem to me that in a very broad sense, any contemporary socialism or communism does require a de-bordering uh, uh, orientation. Um, I agree with what Zizek uh, says when he writes that the main lesson to be learned from the current migration crisis is that humankind should get ready to live in more uh, plastic and nomadic ways as rapid environmental changes require radical redefinitions of natural, of national sovereignty. And my argument would be that biocommunism should, in fact, actively aim to make this um, reinvention or this debordering reinvention in favor of the workers of the world, remembering that migration and nomadism has always been an attribute of proletarianized populations. And the next element of biocommunism uh, would be the expropriation of capital from crisis critical industries. You state that in some cases it is vital to expand production and in others it is necessary to shut it down. When does one apply and when does the other? And how do we get about it since it shouldn't be simply about nationalization? You already mentioned it's not only about the state, but we need a bottom-up um, autonomous element as well. So it's not only about nationalization. What are the concrete institutional forms that this could take? Yeah, okay. Um, so let me try and thread uh, a couple of points together. In one sense, of course, um, with the discussion of expropriation of the expropriators, we're back on very uh, classic Marxian ground. But I think with some uh, with some new uh, some new twists, uh, it's probably fair to say that in general, not always, but 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 broadly, uh, when past generations of Marxists uh, have thought about this, they have thought about. Uh, the expropriation of capitalist industry uh, as a process which will actually um, release the restrained forces of production, which will allow uh, more, right? <laughs> um, and to some degree, this is uh, this uh, this remains true, and often uh, urgently so. 
But with uh, the advent of deepening ecological crisis, uh, sometimes uh, the need uh, to expropriate capital in order to ensure less, in fact, uh, to stop certain types of production uh, becomes apparent. And um, so we can perhaps take two very current instances of uh, social campaigns uh, and struggles to illustrate these two contrary face, uh, faces to contemporary expropriation, or at least attempts towards expropriation, because neither of these examples I'm going to give have, of course, been fully successful. So um, the first I, uh, I will take uh, is the no profit uh, from pandemic campaign to um, uh, attempt to enlarge the availability of, um, and, uh, of anti-COVID uh, vaccines on a scale sufficient to the global scope of the crisis. So, as we know, companies such as uh, such as Pfizer and Moderna were successful, albeit uh, with the help of uh, very high levels of, of state support of uh, pr uh, producing uh, vac uh, vaccines very quickly in the, uh, in the face of a pandemic. But as we all also uh, well know. The uh, distribution of these uh, uh, vaccines is, has been uh, massively uneven, and given uh, uh, their scarcity uh, or unavailability in the global south, so it's quite properly described as a state of uh, vaccine apartheid. And it is in this context that we saw the emergence of a, a, a very eloquent and, and widely supported uh, uh, cam uh, campaign to uh, compel. World Trade Organization to some uh, relaxation of the intellectual property rights of Big Pharma in order uh, in order to enable the establishment of drug manufacturing uh, plants where they were most urgently needed. Now this campaign, one uh, eventually uh, won some modest success, some minor relax concessions from the big uh, drug companies. I'm not pretending. For a moment, that this is a full project of expropriation, but the logic, the logic, the um, the, the vector that it points towards shows how yes, indeed, there are situations in which expropriation is called for because we need to unleash from the fetters of profit or uh, of profit-oriented uh, uh, production goods and services that are desperately needed by uh, by people around the world. A sort of um, uh, contrary example of the need, uh, or example of the need to expropriate in order to restrict production is, uh, of course, uh, the fossil fuel industry, uh, in which uh, climate activists uh, from several directions uh, produced plans for what, for the moment, we will broadly call nationalizing fossil uh, fuel uh, companies or placing them under public control precisely in order to uh, enable a, a swift and orderly close down uh, of this type of activity. This is very well described, I think, in uh, Holly Jean Buck's um, uh, book on uh, net zero, where she speaks about uh, the need to, quote, end things, right? And the need to have a process which leads to the ending uh, uh, of things. And so we could say that the placing of uh, oil and gas coal co uh, companies under forms of democratic public control, and I'm going to emphasize that democratic because many big oil companies are in fact state sovereign uh, companies, but which act like private companies just responding to the world market. The need for those forms of um, uh, uh, of public control becomes uh, indispensable for, in fact, ceasing what shall we call it noxious the noxious behaviors of capital, which are uh, which are destroying uh, uh, the biosphere. Now, here we come to uh, the issue about the forms of uh, that this uh, type of democratic and communal control might uh, take. 
And it's here, I think, that um, thinking about movements um, uh, for forms of global commons, which have been ongoing now uh, for decades, and the wealth of intellectual and political activity that has attended this, have been really important because um, uh, the term commons uh, has really become a signifier around which uh, um, have been gathered a wide variety of forms of thought as to how communal ownership might take forms that are more um, uh, more genuinely uh, uh, participatory and democratic, less subject uh, to corruption and 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 capture than uh, the uh, highly bureaucratic um, uh, top-down forms of uh, national uh, uh, utilities, which are often seen at, you know, as, you know, as the archetypal form of nationalized industry. I mean, sometimes, these, sometimes those forms function very well, but sometimes they, sometimes they, they don't. And what thinking about commons has done is I think add to our repertoire um, of the different uh, ways in uh, in which democratic uh, control of economic resources can be initiated, whether it is through various forms of uh, cooperatives, worker cooperatives, consumer co uh, cooperatives, co uh, platform cooperatives, whether it is uh, through various types of uh, uh, open source or peer-to-peer -peer activities as uh, you know, have been uh, uh, developed by thinkers like Richard Stallman and uh, Mich uh, Michelle uh, Bowens uh, taking you know, full advantage of uh, the immense capacities of digital uh, networks to uh, create a widely shareable forms of goods and, uh, and services and innovations, or even uh, through the thought that's been uh, put by some sections of the green movement into the creation of trusts of, of, of various types of uh, public institutions, which may take various environmental resources uh, outside of the market, but also place them at, uh, but also standing at some arm's length from direct state administration. So this, I think, is, is, is the immense benefit that has come from thinking around commons. Um, in, the, in my essay on, on biocommunism, I also say, though, that uh, the reason I approach this topic through the issue of expropriation rather than through commons is that I think some, not all, writing on, on, uh, on commons uh, has suffered from a certain weakness. Um, in uh, not sufficiently emphasizing the need to dispossess capital as well as create commons. And here, I, you know, I would take some of my own writings, uh, for, um, my own er uh, earlier writings on commons uh, to task. I think that we today have a much better understanding of how capital can, in fact, not only quite happily coexist with a lot of commoning initiatives such as as, as workers uh, cooperatives, but can itself in fact very often co-opt what seem like excellent commons initiatives and and long and complex saga of the um, transformation of free so the free free software movement the free and open source software where and you know to the situation now where we have you know microsoft as as a company ch uh, 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 champion so and so-called uh, open source innovation tells us something about this so my thought about commons today is you know yes commons are great they're vital you know, one can't really discuss communism without thinking about something like commons, but it seems to me that uh, we also have to, in the same breath, speak about the decapitation of capital, in fact, in order to create the space in which these very important new forms of, of, of commons actually become 
uh, the predominant and central institutions of, uh, of society. Okay, that's very interesting because it also kind of touches upon the question of the state and uh, maybe a bit about the question that very diff difficult question of uh, transition and transformation because uh, this sounds to me as if at the end you are not ditching this idea of communism that you uh, uh, invented as a, as a term in a, I think, 2007 uh, paper, but that you would kind of urge for a maybe a radicalized uh, uh, additional movement to communism. So uh, common, communism plus the abolition of privatized uh, ownership and production. So, so you need both elements uh, in order to then make happen uh, the communism as a widespread type of uh, relationality as well. Do I, do I get that right? Communism with teeth, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so um, now let's get to the, the, the next element of biocommunism, which is actually, to me at least, uh, some of the juicy stuff, the question of rationing. You argue for rationing, and while I personally uh, think you raise some, some good points there, I would nonetheless kind of uh, disagree with the framing. But before I get to formulate my skepticism, could you elaborate on this idea of rationing as a principle of biocommunist governance? Yes, yes. So, indeed, I understand well. Uh, rationing is a not a topic favored by, by Marxisms or indeed by many forms of, 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 uh, of leftism. You know, historically, a, a certain uh, confidence in expanding forces of production Uh, has always steered the left away or from discussions of uh, scarcity. But I think it is really apparent that in the current uh, poly crisis, in fact, rationing repeatedly rears its head, either as an immediate response to shortages, be they of oil or gas, I just read this morning, in fact, uh, Germany is, uh, in fact, um, ramping up its, its plans for rationing of gas in, you know, in, um, uh, because of the disruptions uh, uh, caused by the war, or even the indeed uh, 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 rationings of food caused by wartime disruptions and corporate op uh, uh, opportunism. These topics come up. And indeed, in a longer term horizon, you should recognize that Many um, ecological thinkers have always and now increasingly think about forms of carbon rationing as an emergency fallback if carbon taxes, carbon trading and other mechanisms, market mechanisms fail to halt global warming, as indeed seems ex uh, extremely likely. Um, you know, if one looks at uh, uh, so one of the uh, few, I think, uh, really comprehensive attempts to comprehensively deal with uh, rationing as a socioeconomic mechanism is Stan uh, Cox's um, uh, book on the topic. It's an environmentalist account of rationing. And he shows that, first of all, the ration has, under various names, always been uh, basic in many pre-capitalist societies, that socialist societies uh, have used governmental rationing uh, as Uh, a means of social uh, equalization. Uh, again, there's, um, uh, Cuba is, is an, an interesting uh, example in this respect. And uh, within capitalism, non-market rationing, and we should remember that the market is itself a rationing mechanism, but non-market uh, rationing is in fact regularly deployed to allocate necessities such as food, fuel, or water when escalating inequalities threaten the social order. Now, this is, this is uh, and, and those sorts of usages are, are deeply ambivalent. Um, one has situations uh, in contemporary Egypt where a food ration for the poor coexists with markets for the better off, and this really serves to stabilize and uphold vertiginous inequalities except um, uh, when the ration is reduced, uh, when it becomes an occasion for food riots. But you know, there are also other historical moments where comprehensive rationing and, of food and other supplies 
has in crisis situations not only actually enjoyed broad popular support, but has also modeled wider social uh, uh, equalization. And the classic instance was uh, Britain's wartime rationing, which one can say was in many ways prefigurative of the creation of uh, the welfare state, which you know, for all for all its inadequacies, in, inadequacies was um, number, uh, nonetheless an uh, an important reformist initiative. So, uh, my situ my uh, suggestion, and I understand well it, it it it's very contestable, is that if one accepts biocommunism as a, a project with a double orientation towards equality and uh, uh, sustainability. One should at least consider the possibility of the place that rations might might place in uh, in such a project. You know, I think you know one could very easily say that rationing of some specific ecologically damaging goods today, such as airline flights, might be uh, an extremely uh, uh, good measure. Uh, you know, rather than uh, uh, allowing a market free for all in which the rich continue to fly all over the planet and no one else can, uh, can afford to do so at all. One might, depending on how the whole questions of, uh, of energy uh, transition uh, uh, start uh, to shake out, consider whether, in fact, broader quotas for energy uh, use which ensured some degree of, equalize, uh, of uh, uh, equalization um, would res both restrain consumption in ways that reduced ecological dis uh, destruction and act against the huge inequalities in access to material resources that exist. Also, and I know we'll come back to this, I do want to emphasize that there are two sides to the concept of the ration. Ration is not just limit, but it is guarantee. It's a prohibition, but it's also a promise. It's security as well as a scarcity. If one allocates a ration, um, it uh, points to the organization of society around the universal provision of a limited but, ass but assured and broadly egalitarian basket uh, of goods. And my, my suggestion is that in uh, a, a, the midst of this multidimensional series of crises that are rendering markets increasingly chaotic, exacerbating social inequalities horribly, uh, and accelerating ecological uh, devastation, it may be that the, uh, the ration will represent for biocommunism uh, a sort of guarantee that may come to uh, to seem increasingly attractive, but I do understand well that you know that, that there are concerns that 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 people have about these ideas, and so um, you know I think you should make your uh, uh, your points on this, your important points. Yeah, and I mean I think uh, actually at the end we are not that far apart from each other because uh, specifically this point of uh, rationing as a promise is uh, absolutely uh, brilliant I think uh, I would simply uh, argue that that it should be framed diff differently I think that this is the most important element I would uh, uh, point towards when when criticizing this idea of rationing so as I said I'm I'm skeptical about this type of framing the framing of the problem as one of scarcity at the end And one of the reasons for this is that scarcity is basically the the home turf of liberalism, so to speak. It it feeds on the idea of scarcity, liberalism, and this fear of scarcity is also tightly coupled to a cultural uh, hierarchization in which a specific idea of economic rationality has already been established as the quote unquote correct relationality in regards to the future. It is a, a cultural hierarchy in which some, and this is usually a white Western male, are marked as possessing a rationality that is capable of uh, keeping the given abundance in the world. And then there are those marked as quote-unquote primitives who, 
through their supposed lack of rational relation to the future and the wastefulness associated with it bring scarcity into the world. So this uh, cultural hierarchization is, of course, still very much active today and it is deeply embedded in our institutional structures, popular narratives and also self-perceptions. Uh, thus, if uh, one thinks that one can activate this liberal fear of scarcity in order to mobilize, e.g. for a, a more effective addressing of the climate crisis, one kind of enters a terrain in which a specific set of supposed solutions already by far dominates the field. And it is a terrain in, in which one can only lose, I would say, because the way the problem is posed already works against us in this case. So uh, my argument would be, and the alternative is, as I said, already clearly present in your proposal in, in the form of uh, the ration as a promise, my argument would be to frame the whole thing uh, differently and not coming from a fear of scarcity, but as an offer of another kind of abundance, e.g. as a, a social kind of abundance, a non-material abundance. And crucially, also an offer of real existential security, as you just stated, uh, um, with the ration as a promise. And of course, this uh, real security can, by definition, only be non-excluding. So it needs to be uh, universal in order to really be a true security, I would say. Um, in contrast, it, it seems to me that framing it as a problem of scarcity is actually uh, kind of counterproductive to the whole cause because, as I said, it, it pushes the, the, the debate into an uh, area in which um, one can only lose, I would argue. And uh, also there is already this very positive narrative element of, um, of uh, rationing as a promise, as a like existential security that one can put into the forefront. And so I would basically um, more or less argue for framing that that highlights the strength. And when it comes to the question of rationing, I would say it's easy to include this idea of rationing uh, on, a, on a meta level where we have um, like global caps on different types of, uh, like you mentioned, CO2 and other things as well. So if you have like uh, global caps and then you have a, a type of um, a democratically planned economy that works within these boundaries, you already have this question of rationing addressed on a more higher scale. And so it wouldn't be of need to, to make use of this difficult narrative and idea of, of rationing on an individual level, I, I'd say. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, I think, uh, accept your, um, uh, your, your, your suggestion as uh, a really important and, uh, and a valuable idea uh, as to how to reframe uh, this part of the, uh, of the argument. And indeed, um, yeah, I mean, I would say, uh, I basically cover my ass on, on 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 these questions by saying I put you know I, that I that I, I put forward uh, this uh, proposal of uh, of biocommunism as a catalyst for precisely this uh, uh, this type uh, of uh, of discussion. I think that we don't differ very much um, on this. I, I'm not perhaps as entirely com uh, convinced as you are that the discussion of uh, of scarcity um, is one uh, in which the left um, is doomed always uh, to lose. I mean, there are you know there, there are a few counterpoints. I mean, you know, communism is a critique of of scarcity. It is a critique of socially created uh, scarcity, where one part of the world eats and the other does not. And and as I've argued today, communism today is also a project in which we want to make some things scarce. We want to make fossil fuels very scarce in, uh, indeed. Um, you know, uh, I live just north of a country which would uh, uh, which would uh, do much better if it made guns a lot scarcer <laughs> than, than, uh, than they were. So I'm not perhaps as worried about. Uh, dial about the way conversations might go on that ground. 
but I think we're, we both agree that rationing is a discussion about why it could start from, uh, from scarcity, certainly goes in other directions towards equality and fairness and towards the rethinking of um, issues of abundance. And here I think we have to take um, Aaron Benan Ebb's um, uh, uh, excellent aphorism about the nature of abundance as, as, a, as, as a social uh, relationship. Uh, very much uh, to heart. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's an important concept uh, to work with. But I will certainly think um, uh, very seriously about the points uh, that, uh, uh, that you've made, and uh, it may well be <laughs> that this part of a uh, of a biocommunist manifesto might need to be rejigged in the sort of directions that 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 you're suggesting. And I mean, I guess one of the elements that will be of great importance when it comes to the question of whether or not rationing in the sense that you propose it will be accepted by the many uh, will be the question of whether or not the decisions that lead up to uh, how rationing will be organized are actually really participatory, are actually really democratic, and whether or not the people have a, a, a sense of being part of this, uh, this idea uh, in a general sense, I would say. And, and I mean, it would be horrible if it comes down to a top-down situation where, where this idea of rationing is uh, simply um, pushed through, um, through some form of coercion, because then it would, of course, create uh, very uh, different scenarios than the ones that you uh, propose, uh, propose and imagine, I would say. Yes, um, uh, uh, absolutely. And indeed, I think this, is, uh, but, uh, this point uh, that you make is applicable not just to rationing, but also to so many other aspects of what we can broadly define as, disa uh, as disaster management. This is, this is um, uh, no, I'm really the question of whether it is disaster management or disaster self-organization, right? Yeah. <laughs> And uh, the next element of biocommunism would be uh, the essential workers. You write that biocommunism, and I quote you here, biocommunism will not be a post-work utopia, but rather a radical recomposition of labor, end quote. And you introduce the essential worker as a figure that will compose a quote unquote universal army of labor. And this is the term you borrow from uh, Frederick Jameson. Could you explain these terms and concepts and how this universal army of labor would come about without turning into a quote unquote totalitarian nightmare? And that's, uh, uh, that's the, the, the negative, the dystopian element you already point so towards in your text as well. Yeah, yeah. So um, I would say that this is uh, perhaps uh, the part of my writing on biocommunism, which is most provocative uh, and, and, and perhaps a little bit inten uh, uh, in, uh, intentionally uh, so. Um, because it, it takes some a, a aim at uh, what I now consider some weaknesses in um, thinking about the future organization of work, including, once again, my, uh, my own weaknesses uh, in this regard. So I think that in attempting to think of um, beyond capital and the organization of labor or work in, um, in that context, there are, um, there are a couple of fallbacks that thinkers on, um, such as, as, uh, as you and I have, uh, have had, certainly either. either it is to preserve the idea of the wage, you know, some, in some concept of, of market socialism, um, which I think actually always ultimately actually leads back to capitalism when, uh, once one preserves the wage form. Or in order to avoid um, uh, that recuperation, left futurists like to presuppose a high level of uh, abundance. Um, 
uh, and in a sense to avoid a number of difficult questions about work by assuming very high levels uh, of uh, of uh, automation. Uh, this is, in fact, really was the the sort of appeal of fully automated luxury communism, which by adopting uh, the sort of um, high technology uh, in, uh, intensity uh, presuppositions uh, about the future was able to raise a whole lot of um, very seriously diff uh, difficult uh, questions about organizations, incentives, uh, uh, and so on, by envisaging what is basically a post-work situation. So um, I, I will admit that I admired Jameson's essay uh, in, uh, in, uh, in which he uh, made this um, highly inflammatory suggestion of a universal army uh, of, uh, of labor, precisely because uh, it, it uh, uh, directly challenges many of the left and the right shibboleths about work uh, and uh, and uh, freedom. So you know, uh, just to give our listeners an idea of this, if they haven't read Jameson's essay, uh, Jameson envisages a socialist society in which every capable person is required to put in the equivalent of uh, four hours of work a day you know, it, this could be calculated on a, on on a daily or weekly or you know, yearly basis, and assume a lot of flexibility on how it's actually divided up. But to basically devote half a, a working day to some socially useful project, and he calls this a universal army of labor, a term which is, of course, uh, especially especially combustible because of the uh, the use of uh, the military. Uh, terminology. So uh, I thought that this was uh, when I first encountered this. I thought this this was a a, a very bold uh, step that uh, Jameson uh, had taken, and not one that could be dismissed um, uh, out of hand. But I have been especially reminded of it in some of the uh, discussions about uh, the effects of climate change. Uh, on work. And in particular, I thought of it when I read uh, a review by uh, Cory Doctorow uh, criticizing Bastani's concept of fully automated luxury communism. And uh, Doctorow writes, remediating climate change will involve unimaginably labor-intensive tasks like relocating every coastal city in the world kilometers inland, building high-speed rail links to replace aviation links, caring for hundreds of millions of traumatized, displaced people, and treating runaway zoonotic and insect-borne pandemics. These tasks will absorb more than 100% of any labor freed up by automation. Every person whose job is obsolete because of automation will have 10 jobs waiting for them for the entire foreseeable future. And in fact, as one thinks you know, more deeply into this uh, situation, you know, one can expand um, Dr. Rao's uh, list of the sort of, shall we say, essential work that will be required by climate change. Emergency firefighters, mass tree planters, rewilding land clearers, solar panel installers, housing insulators, coders of climate sen sensing software, gigafactory uh, workers, and many, many more. In fact, you know, one probably has to think of a massively belated fulfillment of plans for a million climate jobs or, or a Green uh, New Deal, which are unfortunately, I think now, all too likely to be instantiated, not in forward-looking crisis anticipation, but under the increasingly chaotic conditions of a biospheric deterioration, which capital has been incapable of uh, averting. So, um, my point here, here is that climate emergency, as well as the other kinds of emergencies that make up the polycrisis, will take a great deal of work. And in a certain sense, I think one might almost conceive of a situation in which most work becomes emergency work, right? But society will be largely occupied with the tasks uh, of dealing with this species hazardous uh, situation. And I would say that this is the sort of work 
that is unlikely to be done at all or done well by market logics, where it will be conducted, if at all, driven by profit imperatives or perhaps by public subsidization of massive corporate accumulation in a whole new you know, disaster relief construction uh, complex with all the manifold exploitations of labor, which we don't need to detail here because we, we, uh, we understand them all too well in terms of precarity, danger, et cetera. So my view is that in this situation, it's much better to see these large tranches of socially necessary labor explicitly and overtly socially organized. In a context in what counts as socially useful work is subject to democratic uh, decisions on un labor that is undertaken on projects that form part of a discussed and debated and socially decided socioeconomic plan. But that in this condition, the social uh, and uh, collective organization of labor be made explicit by a requirement for uh, 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 all who are, uh, are, are capable to take a share in this type of labor. Now, yes, this does summon up nightmares of forced labor battalions, but I am going to argue that it doesn't have to be like that. Uh, I envisage a situation uh, not in which people are uh, are drafted to any old task, but rather precisely because there are, are so many types of essential work that need to be done. In fact, there is a wide range of choice as to what one does, many types of activity that today are not validated as socially necessary labor. And one thinks here particularly of, um, of uh, traditionally feminized work uh, in, in the area of social reproduction. Are in uh, are indeed so recognized and validated, and I think one can also think about a situation in which uh, workers who are in, uh, engaged as part of the universal uh, army of labor do in fact have very substantial degrees uh, in, uh, of uh, autonomy over their own uh, working activities have the equivalent uh, of unions with, uh, with, uh, with rights to strike, are uh, organized in, uh, in ways which um, entail a, um, uh, many different channels for um, inputs and, and proposals about the conditions and methods uh, that are applied uh, to their tasks, in which uh, people indeed have a say in how their projects are conducted. Indeed, if one wants to think, you know, to pick up the uh, singularly uh, provocative military uh, terminology that Jameson uses, the universal army of labor, I think one wants to think about that not in terms of the sort of 19th century top-down regimentation, but more, you know, here one only gets additionally provocative, but more in terms of, of what are today called um, uh, uh, mission tactics in which there's an understanding that very broad objectives are, uh, are set uh, either by military commanders or in, 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 in our state by, by planners. But in fact, those who execute the task have a very, very high degree of autonomy in determining how the tasks are taken. And indeed, a certain degree of insubordination and deviation from the set plan is intrinsic to the uh, to to the process. Now, you know, in 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 speaking in these terms, I may only have uh, heaped uh, fuel on uh, you know, on an already combustible topic, but that's my line of thought um, uh, about it. But I think you know, uh, I I know you uh, on on this point too. You you know, uh, you have concerns, and I'd like to hear you. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess the the obvious question is uh, is the question of coercion or not. I mean, you right now uh, uh, framed it in a way that allows for a more autonomous way of engaging with the uh, with this work, but still, at the end, if 
everything boils down to a universal army of labor that is obligatory, then uh, of course the question of coercion comes up. So, so uh, yeah. what? In which way are the the subjects uh, disciplined into taking part uh, in this uh, universal army of of labor? So this is of course the the biggest question I have. But uh, I mean, in addition to that, I would say that the way that you framed it uh, when it comes to the different perspectives within the socialist positions, that there are those that are still sticking to some kind of wage form, and then there are the others that are uh, already jumping into a world of abundance, that there are alternative ways. And uh, I would point out specifically the, the developing of uh, communism in the work of Simon Sutterlütti and uh, Stefan Meritz. I'm not mm -hmm. sure, actually, if they refer to your 2007 paper as well. I think they don't. But there's a German book they wrote, which is called Kapitalismus Aufheben. Yeah. And they sketch a world of communism. So, uh, so, so a generalization of commoning and uh, commons as a, uh, um, a principle of, of social organization and in which they envision a a form of um, social production and social reproduction which is based on on radical voluntariness so this would be a so to speak third position in in which it's uh, it's not necessarily tied to an idea of abundance because that's not what they are proposing they are not uh, in the in the in the camp of uh, accelerationist leftist um techno utopianism so to speak but they are very much about different forms of relationality that form a different type of understanding when it comes to this form of um, social reproduction. And, and so there would be a different position, I would say. And it's also really questionable if a form that at the end relies on coercion um, is really more effective in attaining the goal of, for example, participation uh, within this form of um, bio-communist uh, uh, economy, um, and uh, if not, a relying on radical voluntariness um, would be, at the end, even more effective by not trying to force people into work in this case, not through a wage, but through, I don't know which type of coercion you imagine, but some type of coercion uh, seems to be at play, I think. Yes, yeah. Uh, well, I will. Uh, I look forward very much to uh, reading that work on uh, communism and uh, radical voluntarism. You know, behind uh, these questions are the concerns that Uh, the universal army of labor co uh, concept is authoritarian. I would say no, but it does imply a high level of collective social responsibility. I mean, I don't really think that communism is a project for hyper individualists. Right? Hyper individualism, we might say. Uh, is the uh, subjective, I would say, the uh, sort of subjectivity uh, that is produced by the so-called free market. I think that the creation of uh, some form of uh, uh, collective society uh, beyond a capital does uh, re uh, require the creation of some level of social discipline in which there is an expectation that everyone who can contributes in some way to collective well-being. And I would say that um, that sort of normative behavior or normative expectation does indeed, in fact, lie behind most of what we know uh, as um, successful commons undertakings. I think that we can envisage uh, a world in which the production of that type of subjectivity does not centrally uh, depend on, co uh, on coercion. It seems to me that intrinsic to the production of this sort of world is, for example, 
um, much more direction, um, I, I mean, direction in the, uh, in the sense of guidance, uh, uh, advice and assistance for people uh, in terms of uh, uh, defining the sort of paths and types of works that they find than, uh, than is available uh, to people within, cap within capitalist uh, societies. I think one can really, one should really envisage actually as an uh, a very important part of a future communist society. One where a great deal of care is taken in actually uh, helping people develop and cultivate a sense of what kind of um, uh, engagement uh, with work people can constructively have. So there'll also be a situation in which very careful attention is given to the physical and psychological circumstances, limits, and possibilities that different people have for different types of work, in which, in which as I've already said, more types of activity would be recognized as socially valid forms of work than are um, uh, in, uh, under a capitalism in which, as we understand well, vast, vast uh, swathes uh, of, uh, of labor are in fact invisibilized and denied uh, uh, recognition. Um, and to riff again on, you know, I, I think here I'm, I'm borrowing a little bit from, from some recent thoughts uh, again by Banana, but um, we really don't have a very, um, there's, oh, oh, you know, you know, I mean, ultimately, one does have to deal with the so-called free rider uh, uh, situation. You know, that of people uh, who, for whatever reason, uh, really do not wish to engage in a cooperative uh, uh, project of, of work. But we don't really know how that situation would shape up in conditions absent compulsion from uh, from the wage where everyone is getting access to some form of um, universal social services uh, or rations and in which it's clearly understood that w that various forms of work are needed for the society and the species to make a passage through a uh, a planetary uh, emergency now obviously communist society is not one where one leaves anyone, even if they seem incredibly uh, reluctant uh, to work in a state of physical want or social degradation. So everyone gets food, housing, the necessities of life. Ultimately, I would not be averse to think of a situation in which there may be some trade-off for, shall we say, the voluntary refusal to work in terms of perhaps of different levels of access to certain facilities and opportunities, you know, if you've taken your holidays in advance, you know, you don't benefit from the, from the holiday facilities. I think, I think in some ways that's reasonable, that there should be some form of social uh, contract. But more, I think what is uh, really more basic is the creation of new uh, types of subjectivity with a different relation between self-realization and collective identity. And that, that has to be uh, the long-term orientation of a biocommunist project, which I definitely do not conceive of as primarily a coercive project. On the contrary, I see it as one that in fact will uh, liberate people from, from the massive uh, uh, Coerce, uh, uh, coercions that are exercised uh, through the wage or through its absence. Yeah, well, I, I think two, uh, two points. Um, I guess uh, one would be, again, it, maybe it's simply about a, a question of framing, because if you say that, that a biocommunist society will highly depend on a different form of social responsibility, that will then um, uh, allow people to engage in this uh, type of work without 
feeling coerced at least then uh, i kind of wonder why then why why is then any element of coercion needed if there is a, a, a um, an element of social responsibility within the the subjects of uh, biocommunism then you could easily uh, rely on radical forms of voluntariness because you already have this form of social responsibility which will lead the people into wanting to engage in socially necessary work so so this again would be an argument for not uh, going down the road of coercion in any way shape or form uh, and then uh, this will actually be a bit more ab about the question of framing again because uh, by framing it as a, it as a universal uh, army of labor And uh, this connotations of army, again, of course, you will have this sense of top-down hierarchy and authoritarianism within the framing as such. So um, this is actually kind of counterproductive if you want to make the point that it will be a form of relationality that is highly depending on a uh, deeper understanding of let's say, responsibility towards uh, this this different social uh, uh, contract. So this, again, would be a bit critical of, of the type of framing. And then the second thing would be, I, I would be interested in, I mean, you briefly touched upon it when you talked about the free rider problem, but in general, it it's below the surface, but it's not made explicit. What is the, the image of uh, quote unquote, and these are like, massive quote unquote uh, um what is the image of human nature so to speak that you rely on so um i think i mentioned at uh, at at the start that the really the point of departure for thinking about bi uh, biocommunism was a series of reflections on um uh marx's uh, writings predominantly early writings About what he terms a species being, which is you know, which is uh, pre uh, precisely uh, about this issue of what is uh, uh, human nature, right? And in considering this, um, discuss various uh, alternative interpretations as to uh, Uh, what Marx meant by uh, by by species being when he refers to the essential uh, nature of the species is he talking about some uh, innate uh, uh, set of uh, propensities or, or or attributes or is he in fact talking about uh, uh, humans as um, a species uh, whose nature is to remake their own nature to constantly uh, reinstantiate uh, a set of uh, uh, capacities and, uh, and, ten uh, and tendencies based on the convergence of a set of social relations under a, uh, under a particular mode of production. And I think that, this is, that it, it, uh, I favor uh, the, uh, the latter view, that there is, to use it, uh, what is perhaps uh, an unfortunate term today, but uh, a handy one, an extreme plasticity to, uh, 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 to human nature. And that, uh, in fact, uh, what is taken as natural to human transforms with every shift in a mode of, uh, of production. So it is in that light that I think of Uh, of uh, uh, biocommunism, and it is that particular perspective which, uh, in fact, gives me uh, a a reasonable degree of, um, uh, shall we say, optimism, or or or, or, or to think that uh, that a, a beyond capitalist uh, uh, society. Uh, would indeed generate types of subject uh, uh, of of subjects who have tendencies uh, inc uh, and inclinations towards forms of, of uh, behavior which are very much um, eclipsed or subordinated within capitalism. Yes, tendencies towards cooperation, solidarity 
responsibility, so forth and so on. You talk about, um, you talk of uh, coercion. I don't think that all forms of social discipline are necessarily uh, negative. I mean, I actually think that there are situations in which, uh, in fact, it is important uh, for people uh, to have certain types of behavior rewarded more uh, more than others. And uh, depending on the manner in which that is done, that, is, that can actually be an important and constructive part of shaping various, for, uh, various forms of, of, of behavior. You know, I mean, it's, you know, even if one thinks of some very happy activity like playing soccer or something like that, right? There are rules, for, you know, right? And so, uh, I, you know, I think that that we that you know one can arrive at a, uh, at uh, at, a, at a situation in which, um, uh, while one completely outlaws the uh, uh, any form of uh, brutalization or degradation. One can have a structure of rewards, incentives, and even penalties. Um, in, uh, in fact, which uh, which uh, become um, uh, important and ultimately uh, and, and ultimately beneficial in terms of um, uh, of uh, constructing uh, uh, people's capacities and tendencies. And I, I would just simply say, you know, I mean, I can think of occasions in uh, and contexts. Uh, in my own life, in which various forms of discipline, in fact, have been extremely good, knowing that if I behaved one way, I would get some things, and if I behaved uh, uh, an, uh, another way, uh, I, I wouldn't. And so I don't think that uh, the concept of discipline in that sense should be required, should be seen as a no-no in a uh, in uh, uh, in a, in in a discussion of a um, of a uh, of a progressive uh, society. In fact, I actually see a sort of com uh, the complete rejection of concepts uh, of uh, of discipline as much more characteristic of a certain kind of um, of uh, well, I've described it already, uh, liberalism, uh, liberal hyper-individualism, uh, you know. But I don't, I, I don't need to, uh, to expand on, uh, on, on that point. I think, I think that there is probably a reasonable, a reasonable middle ground uh, that, one, uh, that one can arrive at between issues of voluntarism and the uh, social shaping. Uh, uh, of of subjectivities, which would be infinitely more benign uh, and uh, uh, kind and constructive than that uh, to which people are, are subjected un under capitalism today. And again, here the topic comes up: how these forms of discipline uh, are being formed, and who participates in forming them, and how these rules are actually uh, brought about. So this will be, of course, a, a yeah, huge question. Yeah, yeah. Then. And, and let me just return to that point uh, again uh, in regard to this evidently provocative um, uh, proposal about the universal uh, army of labor. This ha we need to put this in a context in which an assumption that I'm making is that the planning of the activities of the universal army of labor is itself a democratic and, uh, and, uh, and socially distributed uh, uh, activity subject to uh, extensive discussion, debate, Various levels of collect uh, of collective determination in ways that have been well discussed in the in the recent efflorescence of, of literature about uh, about uh, how types of uh, of social planning can be conducted. 
So, you know, one, um, uh, I think that, you know, I mean, this is, uh, uh, this is a question that almost any project for a beyond capital society based on collective planning will have, to, you know, will, will, uh, will have to determine if there is going to be, if we are going to democratically determine a plan, how then do we democratically determine that that plan is actually, is actually executed, right? <laughs> And you know, so you know, I I don't think I don't think that that uh, one can shrink from that too much, right? Yeah, right. I mean, again, uh, as I uh, stated before, I think most of of my disagreement would be, uh, at least a, a, a huge part of my disagreement would be about the the framing, because whether or not we can, we would have to uh, call it an army, <laughs> with all the connotation <laughs> that goes along with it, is of course a different question. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. I yeah, uh, uh, yes. Um, it may be that I that I'm that I'm too fond of the provocation uh, value of uh, of some pro. Uh, of, uh, but uh, you know, perhaps it served its purpose because we had an interesting conversation. About yes, it. yes, yes. Of course. And I mean, what you what you uh, stated in in your in the last part of your answer, uh, of course, builds a very nice bridge to the last element of biocommunism you described ecological and economic planning. On this topic, you provide three biocommunist notes, um, one on ecological limits, one on uh, an alternative to consumerism, and then the transmission problem. Will uh, While these are quite short notes within the text, I think they all raised important points. So could you please uh, elaborate on these notes on planning? Uh, yes, yes. Um... Surely, and just let me, uh, I think here I should provide a little bit of contextualization um, uh, for the situation in, in which I, I wrote a paper on which uh, our discussion is based. So there's recently been a huge surge of interest in socialist or communist economic and so, uh, social planning. A surge, a surge, I should say, in which um, Your podcast um, and 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 your writings and those of your associates are a, a very very uh, important contribution. I wrote a 2013 uh, paper called "Red 20 Planning" on contemporary lessons to be learned from Soviet uh, cybernetic uh, planning. But since that time, the discussion has been advanced by what I regard as far more expert uh, scholars, economists, uh, and activists in a multitude of Uh, direction. So but there's now a, a flourishing literature on the sorts of institutions and technologies required for a democratically planned economy. And many of the people um, prominently involved in these discussions were at the conference on socialist futures in which I first tried out uh, this biocommunist idea. And that conference featured important and um, lively discussions, as you saw, uh, about issues such as the relation between algorithmic and associational planning, the role of computers uh, versus humans, and many other aspects of this. So in this paper, rather than, re than uh, recapitulating those discussions, I essentially assumed them. I let the conference, I admit, do a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of um, assumptions about some basic um, elements of planning. And instead, I uh, just made these three perhaps rather cryptic comments on what I saw as their special relevance to, uh, uh, to biocommunism. So something on it just shortly on each. Um, I think that today the uh, importance of including um, ecological data, ecological goals and objectives in any form of economic planning uh, should be absolutely obvious. Indeed, the um, idea that I incorporate into the proposal for biocommunism, that planning should take account of two boundaries, as it were, the uh, boundaries of ecological and social uh, sustainability is not a new one by any means. Uh, many green thinkers have promoted it uh, for well over a decade. However, in practice, 
this idea of planning to situate uh, humans uh, sociality and economic activity between these uh, uh, th uh, these two boundaries has been largely hijacked by corporate greenwashers uh, who have chosen to interpret the idea of social sustainability uh, as uh, the uh, ongoing necessity for economic growth, aka uh, expanded capital accumulation. Right? I therefore see um, biocommunism as a project would would apply that a uh, boundary model of planning between horizons of social and ecological sustainability in a way that a uh, sees a very high degree of social equalization of living conditions as a prerequisite for social sustainability it has to be a, a highly egalitarian society and b removes the presupposition of growth or of increased material throughputs in human uh, production as, a, as a, an a priori assumption. That is to say, uh, I see biocommunist planning as a process which should be open to, though not necessarily tied to, concepts such as those of degrowth or of growth of certain economic activities in some, uh, in, uh, in some zones and decreases in certain uh, spheres of activity and in perhaps in, in certain regions in others. The important, the critical factor is that that decision is not taken as uh, already a given, but as an issue for social decision, uh, which is made dependent on changes in environmental, technological, and other uh, uh, conditions. The transmission problem, I think, is also well known. Uh, that, uh, what I mean by this is uh, the tendency in historic and highly top-down planned economies, such as that of the former USSR, for planners to be given misinformation by producers who fear retribution for failing to make quotas or seeking to hoard uh, resources, consequently corrupting the entire uh, process of uh, foresight and coordination that should be intrinsic to planning. Um, Alec Nove wrote many years damningly about uh, about this uh, this information problem, and that is in fact precisely why, in my perspectives for biocommunism, I wanted to emphasize the importance of planning conducted in a context of multifarious uh, or uh, organizations. Uh, with uh, strong uh, worker protections, including protections and indeed encouragements for criticizing, correcting, and, propo uh, uh, and proposing alternatives to plans from above, back to the mission tactics uh, for, the, for the universal uh, uh, army uh, of labor. I'll go last with the issue of what you term an alternative to consumerism because I think in, in some ways this is perhaps the most important. As you know well, a great deal of uh, uh, market positive uh, criticism of planning hinges on what is known as the calculation problem. That is to say, the uh, difficulty of predicting millions upon millions of consumer choices involving a vast range uh, of uh, of differentiated commodities. In many ways, uh, this was Friedrich Heydrich, uh, Hayek's uh, line of attack uh, on uh, on planning the impossibility, in fact, of any pl uh, planning pr uh, uh, process repli uh, replicating this type of complex uh, uh, decision making. And it's a, a strong uh, attack. One that many people uh, have uh, recently put a lot of work into refuting. However, it is worth bearing in mind that it may not be the um, self-chosen task of a future communism to recreate a complex consumerist society. In a talk I gave many years ago, 
went on at great length about the calculation problem. Um, Jeffrey K. once uh, remarked to me at the end that to the degree that one can attain some social consensus on the provision of a certain common or universal basket of goods, and has that accepted as a norm, then the calculation problem starts to become much less difficult. It starts to recede, as it were, in, cent uh, in centrality. And planning can be devoted to more interesting and important ends rather than in, uh, in, uh, ensuring the supply of endless varieties of mobile phones, automobiles, deodorants, you name it. That observation uh, has stuck with me, and I think it may be key to establishing something like biocommunism. Um, I am very attracted to uh, some of the concepts put forward by green economists, uh, such as um, George Monbiot, is a concept of what he terms uh, uh, public luxury and private sufficiency, that of a society uh, in which um, very large investments are, uh, are put into the uh, creation of uh, available uh, shared environments and uh, activities, creating um, uh, rich and ecologically uh, flourishing uh, urban environments, for example, or you know, large uh, opportun uh, uh, opportunities for um, many people uh, to have excellent uh, uh, holidays on occasion in your know, created uh, public uh, uh, facilities, but where private uh, consumption is at a level that, as a first put, that is sufficient, that is you know, uh, um, uh, comfortable, but it, uh, where uh, 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 it uh, does not become the uh, uh, the prime uh, the primary axis within which. Uh, levels of extravagance or uh, cons uh, uh, con uh, conspicuous uh, consumption and start of seeking and so on uh, are part of it. I think that's very important, and I think that that, that uh, could well be uh, incorporated as something within uh, a, a biocommunist horizon and something which also um, uh, reconfigures to some degree, some of the, the problems which uh, attend uh, ideas of democratically planning uh, very complex uh, societies. So those were my uh, three notes on, on those points. And I mean, you already mentioned it at the beginning of our conversation uh, that you think that the state will play a crucial role within biocommunism. I mean, uh, Of course, it's it's not an unproblematic actor, the state. So uh, could you maybe elaborate a bit on the role of the state within biocommunism? Yeah, okay. So, um, uh, fair enough. I think in the introduction to my essay, I, I suggest that biocommunism, uh, in my thinking, could be defined by a triangulation between three other concepts of communism. Uh, solar communism, war communism and disaster communism. Uh, that is to say, it affirms the potential for a new and relatively plenitudinous mode of species reproduction, drawing, for example, on clean, renewable energy, social, uh, uh, widely uh, socially dis uh, distributed, as prophesized by Schwarzman and various other people who've written on, on the on on the uh, on the concept of uh, so, uh, solar communism, uh, but it also uh, holds that um, the conditions for this will have to be created um, in the emergency context that I've already outlined of disaster, rescue, repair, and restoration as a massive operation of salvage from the damage that has been done to the planet by capitalism. 
Yes, it accepts that this will require the emergency mobilization of of uh, resources, many of which can only at this moment be commanded through the state apparatus. And here, I follow the argument made by um, Andres Malm um, in his return to the concept of war communism as uh, articulated uh, uh, by Lenin in the depth uh, of the crisis of the Bolshevik uh, revolution. And also to the thinking of, I think, very serious um, uh, socialist uh, scholars of uh, global warming like Christian uh, Parenti, and so on, who basically uh, uh, argue that it is in fact imperative that the state apparatus uh, uh, be mobilized in, uh, in order to quell uh, global, uh, global warming. There is uh, uh, no other route uh, than that. But I also accept that uh, while the state, uh, while indeed the state apparatus is necessary uh, at, uh, at this m moment, uh, even the exertion of that apparatus divide, uh, demands forces uh, well beyond uh, its scope, including the various forms of autonomous organization, uh, uh, mutual aid, communization that have been. Um, uh, postulated by groups such as Out of the Woods and other anarchist or, uh, or communization uh, theorists. So uh, what I am attempting to propose uh, in biocommunism is a situation in, uh, in which, yes, the state is in play, but it is engaged with these wider uh, so, uh, social movements. And that um, interplay between state and, uh, and movements, in fact, transforms both of them in a certain uh, sense, in as much as it creates, shall we say, a much more democratically distributed fabric uh, of, uh, of, uh, of governance in which both various state departments and functions become uh, disaggreg uh, disaggregated from a totalizing uh, control system. And conversely, various uh, forms of uh, communal self-organization uh, come to play an ever more Im uh, important part and become, uh, in fact, an absolutely uh, 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 critical set of nodes uh, and, and channels for the uh, 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 in terms of social decision making, you know, I again, I, I know I'm going to set something off uh, off here if I, uh, if, if I say this, but I believe that well-known biocommunist scholar Donald Rumsfeld, uh, amongst his many sayings, come up with your if you have a problem, make it bigger, right? And that's really my. Uh, 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 my view on the uh, on the governance question. If you have a you know, uh, if we have a problem with uh, with this, with the state form, uh, in fact, uh, the way it should be addressed is not so much that the state is going to wither away, but that it should be exploded from within, actually, by uh, 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 the expansion and distribution of governance. Uh, uh, functions um, th uh, through a much wider range of uh, of, in uh, of institutions, all of which have their part uh, to play wi uh, within this process. Uh, to come back to a phrase I I've already used um, uh, that Marx described as the creation of vast association, and I would say that is that uh, that. Uh, uh, that would be my my perspective on uh, the state question in biocommunism. And this kind of nicely leads me to the question of transition. I mean, uh, you you state explicitly within the paper that this is uh, not about transition and that this is actually a topic that is in general very much important that, that but that you do not address within the paper. But I thought I'll I'll ask anyway. 
So uh, how do we get to the point where we can explode the state from within? So do you have any thoughts about transition? I, I have um, a very brief thought um, or really just a reference on this because obviously this could be another two hours worth of conversation, right? And, and, and should be. So I'm simply going to say that my thinking about transition and the struggles um, along, uh, along that road has recently been uh, very strongly influenced by Rodrigo Nunes in his, um, what I consider outstanding work, neither vertical nor, uh, nor horizontal towards the theory of political uh, organization. I think that this is a book that does a great deal to overcome left fetishisms and divisions both about different forms of communist organization and about the relation of different groups engaged in the struggles against capital. Nunes uh, writes eloquently, I think, about the need to create what he terms an uh, ecology of, uh, of struggles. And although I don't normally favor that um, sort of naturalizing discourse, I think that in uh, uh, in this case, uh, he uh, carries it off uh, very well in terms of uh, uh, ma uh, of making the argument uh, for a uh, type of transition uh, movement that he is, in fact, thinking very uh, obviously centrally about environmental traditions, but uh, transitions, but also anti-capitalist transitions, in which uh, one will have a multiplicity of different forms uh, of, uh, uh, of, organi uh, of organizations uh, and, uh, and which the critical factor will be to consider the types of reciprocities, interdependencies and complementarities that can be created between these different modalities of organization rather than looking for, as he puts it, the one weird trick that will be it the strike, the riot, the occupation, whatever, uh, that will undo capitalism. Now, I don't want to usurp uh, Rodrigo's uh, voice. Um, uh, I do want to recommend strongly uh, his work to your listeners. But actually, one of the things that I love about his, his book is the use to which he puts a quote from the 1960s uh, poet uh, Diane de Prima. And the quote is this, no one way works. It will take all of us shoving up the thing from all sides to bring it down. And I would add, yes, and there is going to be a lot of shoving. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, again, a very nice bridge to my last question, which would be, if you think about the future, what makes you joyful? Joy is in the present. I don't know what the what the future holds. You know the, the saying, I think it's a Polish one, those who look into crystal balls, that is, they will be like the fortune tellers, should be prepared to eat ground glass. But I do truly enjoy the opportunity to converse with you and I hope indirectly with our listeners about how we might together overcome great dangers in order to create a new and more joyful society. Well, Nick, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for taking the time to be part of uh, Future thank Histories. Thank you uh, for uh, giving me this opportunity to um, present um, the, uh, uh, these, again, I said very nascent uh, thoughts and uh, for nurturing them Uh, uh, with the incisive questions and 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 um, uh, suggestions uh, that you've made, I, I truly appreciate it. Thank you very much, Jim. That was our show for today. Thanks a lot for listening. If you want to support Future Histories, you can do so on Patreon. For this, visit patreon.com slash futurehistories or you can simply tell a friend that you liked the show and that he, she or they might like it as